Okay, thank you for coming and thank you for staying here until the very end of the meeting. Uh, I'm Germán Urizaola from the University of Oviedo in Spain. <coughs> and my idea is to give you a bit of a short glimpse of this project I've been developing over the last four years, trying to understand how is the situation of the amphibians living in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And this is not particularly because I'm interested in radiation, I'm interested in general in how organisms face environmental variation be that variation caused by differences in the temperature or differences in the abundance of composition of predators, parasites, or whatever. But we also know that more and more frequently, organisms out in the wild are exposed to other sources of environmental variation, sources caused by us, by humans. And that's, that, those could be uh, alteration of the habitats or, uh, in many cases, pollution, and we have seen already during this session. And a particular form of pollution is, of course, radioactive contamination, quite localized in the geographic scale, fortunately, but with huge uh, socio-economic uh, impact on uh, socio-economic interest. And when we talk about radioactive contamination, of course, we need to go back to the 80s and to the Soviet Union, and in particular to April, April uh, 86 uh, and the uh, Chernobyl power plant. Uh, on 26th of April, during a test, as many of you know, especially if you have seen the recent TV series, this reactor blow up and released the largest amount of uh, radioactive material ever, ever released in human history. It's estimated that it, it was about 400 times a nuclear bomb like the ones released in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And of course, and I always want to address this, uh, this caused a huge impact in, in humans both at the physical and the psychological levels and lead to the evacuation of more than 300,000 people from the exclusion zone, people that never went back to that area. And this has led to the classic image that we know from Chernobyl, those uh, abandoned cities that were claimed by the forest and also abandoned villages that no one is uh, living there anymore and are also included into, into the big forest. And at the time of the accident, the general idea is that, considering the half-life of some of the radionuclides, this area will become a desert for life. It will become an area uh, devoid of any life, a nuclear wasteland for thousands and thousands of years. But when we go back uh, to this area right now, and we have been there all, uh, three weeks ago, the sort of landscape that we encounter at this is some of our localities uh, of the study. This is Luboka Lake, one of the most uh, highly contaminated, radioactive contaminated places on Earth. This beautiful landscape, and we have something that is full of wildlife, full of birds singing and breathing. Or oh, this other area, Albuchin Lake, as you can see, is just by the reactor, just one kilometer apart from the reactor. And it's at one of the best areas for amphibians that we have in the exclusion so Full of amphibians, high abundance, high diversity. Of course, this that doesn't make sense. So you either have uh, a nuclear wasteland, a desert of life, or you have places like this. No? Even more, you consider the range of big mammals that, that you have in the, in the zone. Right now, you have all the big mammals you could imagine. You have brown birds, you have all the kinds of big predators, wolves, uh, Sebastian horses, everything you could imagine in Europe. So as I said, it doesn't make sense. So you either have this sort of nature paradise or you have a desert uh, for life. And this is the main uh, question we want to address with this project. So what's happening with Chernobyl wildlife? How is possible that all this diverse and abundant fauna is living in this still uh, highly contaminated environment? And for answering this big question, we work with our uh, favorite study subject, the amphibians, and in particular, most of the studies we have been developing are with this species, the Easter tree frog, a small and rather terrestrial frog that lives uh, all across the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So we have been sampling this, this species, as I said, all across a gradient of radioactivity from the really highly contaminated places uh, near the power plant to the medium contaminated places on the left bank to areas with uh, low radiation levels still within the exclusion zone, and also using some areas outside the exclusion zone as external controls. And with these sort of localities, we try to maximize the, the range of traits we have been examining 
we, we have been looking from morphology, physiology, effects on the age, and moving now to all the epigenome uh, and metagenome and genomics. So the first results, uh, uh, I'm going to show you some uh, preliminary results of some of the ideas we are working with right now. The first result I always want to, to mention, and it, it may look trivial, but if you consider that uh, the idea is to find a nuclear, a nuclear wasteland, a desert for life, the first result I, I want always to say is we we'll find frogs. <laughs> but we are there, we find frogs, and actually quite a lot of frogs. And uh, as I said before, one of the best places for finding amphibians are often the most highly contaminated places. That is a fair result. A second one that also may seem trivial is that the frogs are normal. <laughs> so they have four legs and a single head. And then so it's quite, quite normal. So normal frogs. As you can see, the only thing that we could uh, already, at the very first night, see that is different, uh, even with the naked eye, is something related with the coloration of those frogs. So those frogs originally are this kind of really pale and bright uh, green. But already on the first night I walked the ponds in Chernobyl, uh, I saw many of them really black or grey. So already the second year we start to look at the coloration of those frogs much more in detail, doing this kind of standardized colors. And here we have one of the sort of standard eastern tree frogs, and here is one of the frogs that we also find in Chernobyl. Probably it's not even possible to differentiate for the background, but it is really, really black. So looking at this, uh, the first, I think, really cool uh, result we have is that there's a clear difference in coloration between the frogs living inside and outside exclusion zone. Frogs living inside exclusion zone are much, much darker. So this is the average coloration for a frog living in, in the exclusion zone, and this is one from the outside. So this is a, a luminosity, luminescence. It's much, much darker, and this is caused mainly by the uh, green coloration. So if there are much that are much darker in the in the green in the green spectrum. So this is really cool because at least for us we know that darker coloration and increasing melanin has been linked many many times with protection to UV radiation. But more recently has been also linked to resistance to ionizing radiation. For, for us it could be a really good example of really really rapid evolution and selection towards darker coloration in frogs living in side exclusion zone and exposed to uh, high radiation levels. That will be a really fast and really cool study. We have more or less ready on the analysis, by the way. So all the thing that we have been looking at is the age and the age in pattern, because one of the ideas is, OK, you go there, uh, all individuals look fine. But one of the causes that may be better is uh, a shorter life span or a faster aging. They look fine, but at the end they are living shorter life. So doing uh, skeletal chronology methods, we can estimate the age of every single individual we have been working with. And it doesn't look like there is a big difference uh, in age connected with radiation. So it's, uh, it's all, bit all over the place. Uh, it's true that uh, only really all individuals appear in medium, medium, low radiation levels. But this relationship is not, is not significant. We need to add a few more individuals uh, from, the, from the last year and we'll see well, where we go. But it doesn't look like it's, it's at least nothing really, really uh, strong in this sense. It's the same with aging. We have been looking at telomere, so the cap end of the chromosome that gets sorted and sorted with cell division. And it's, it's a good proxy for, for aging in, in, many, in many organisms. So look at that, uh, uh, those rates of each individual in relation with the relative telomere length. Again, there's really nothing on, nothing on here. So it doesn't look like uh, living in the really highly contaminated areas is speeding the aging of those individuals. Well, the factors we have been looking at is different physiological traits, and in particular, blood physiology, looking at many different uh, traits that could be linked to kidney damage, liver damage, or general uh, physiological imbalances. Well, for all those traits, there were no effects between uh, frogs live in, in high contamination area, medium contamination area, or completely clean environments. <coughs> only for one of the traits, there is a, uh, yeah, on the, on the water, uh, significant differences, which is with CO2 that is higher inside exclusion zone. Uh, this could be a, a hint of, of uh, higher stress levels in those frogs living in, 
inside the screws and so on, but as I said, this is marginally significant, but it's the only one out of all the, all the 13 we have been looking at. So we have been also looking at immune levels because one of the uh, ideas is that probably those individuals living in uh, highly contaminated environments, may, they may have uh, lower immune levels too. That may be one of the causes they could be better. We have been looking at this, uh, looking at the neutrophile to lymphocyte ratio, that is a, a common standard for looking at the immune level of the individuals. And once again, we haven't found anything. There's no clear relationship between um, radiation levels of the individuals with the neutrophile to lymphocyte ratio. So again, no effect at the, at the immunological level. So this is as I said, some of the preliminary results we have, but I want to uh, use uh, some minutes to uh, tell you one of the last uh, projects we have been involved in, the kind of thing we have been doing uh, yeah, a few weeks ago in the discussion zone, that is uh, moving into the genomics and moving into a particular, I think particularly interesting study in which we will compare genomic changes and mutation accumulation in a species that have been in the exclusion zone living for 30 years. And this is possible because we have found in the Russian Academy of St. Petersburg uh, samples from frogs that were collected in Chernobyl in 1987, just months after the, uh, after the accident. So those uh, samples that we already have on our lab uh, will allow us to compare with uh, frogs that we have collected exactly in the same locations a few, a few weeks ago. So that's a rather unique uh, opportunity to go back in time and test uh, all those things. So our idea for this summer is to start with this high rat sequencing uh, studies that are really good with all samples from, from, the, from museums with our colleagues from the University of Osan, Glyn Masepa and Thomas Shushan, uh, with, uh, with the idea of trying to detect first uh, mutation accumulation in all those samples and also trying to detect uh, comparing uh, frost collecting inside exclusion zone and outside exclusion zone. Uh, how many of those changes are kind of common and are occur probably just uh, as a question of time and uh, what kind of, of, of changes are unique. And this is particularly relevant in one of the species we are working with, that is uh, what they call <coughs> frog, because this is an hemiclonal species. So we have the opportunity to, to work with a clonal genome of a vertebrate that has been exposed to radiation for 30 years with no recombination, with no pooling of any, any mutation. So we have a really <coughs> unique opportunity to look at all the mutation accumulation in adulterated exposed to radiation, to high radiation levels on the environment for 30 years. So in a big summary, we don't find much effects right now, 33 years after the accident. So actually our big question has changed from looking for effects to, uh, to looking for adaptive responses. We are looking to the kind of parameters or the kind of genomic changes that are allowing those individuals to live in an environment that is still highly contaminated with radiation. Of course, we, there are some others that we would like also to work with is all the stages of the life cycle because we normally work with uh, adults. We want to know what happens with the embryonic stages, all the larval stages, and another of the holy grails of uh, working in Chernobyl would be doing actually real experiments in Chernobyl with uh, possible reciprocal transplant experiments in the area that would be really, really good for looking at local adaptation or things like that. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all collaborators for this project involved a lot of collaboration. I would want to highlight Pablo Murato that is sitting over there, and our colleagues, Sergei Gaschak from Ukraine, all our funding agencies, and you for being here. Thank you. We have an hour for the super social, so if there are questions. <laughs>